Hello everybody back again with another uh, end game that we are going to extract some principles that hopefully you can uh, utilize in your uh, chess games. Uh, I love studying the end game because uh, end game theory is constant unlike uh, opening uh, theory which is always changing. Um, and that reminds me of a quote. Uh, from Paul Benko when talking about the end game and the reason he liked to study it and he said that it was the purest form of chess it doesn't change in theory like openings it is permanent opening theory is not real chess I think so interesting thoughts uh, coming from a legendary player and speaking of Paul Benko this position is a study created by Paul Benko in 1987 um, where it is uh, white to move here okay but uh, before getting into it I just want to uh, give respect where it's due um, and tell you a little bit about Paul Benko if you don't know who he is if you do know uh, just bear with me because I want to make sure I give respect to these uh, um, chess players who contributed greatly to our game but uh, really, uh, in my opinion, have not getting the, uh, getting, you know, haven't gotten the credit that they uh, truly uh, deserve. So I like to at least mention who they are, where they came from, etc. So Pal Banco um, uh, lived from 1928 all the way to 1919. So he was with us, with, with us a very long time. Um, chess Grandmaster. And he was uh, one of the world's uh, best chess players uh, for about 20 years. All right. Uh, he, in my opinion, is basically responsible for uh, Bobby Fischer uh, becoming a uh, world chess championship. And now before you go crazy, uh, just hear me out. So, um, uh, Benko was among the final eight participants, right, uh, in the tournaments to determine the challenger for the World Chess Championship in 1959 and in 1962. Back in the days, they would have these long uh, candidate tournaments, you know, 20-round tournaments and things like that. And they, um, you know, between uh, eight players, whoever won would become uh, the uh, candidate or the challenger for the world title. So, uh, Banco was very strong and he um, was among the final eights in um, two of these candidates' tournaments, one in 1959 and another in 1962. Both times he didn't uh, become uh, the candidate or the challenger, rather. And he, you know, he, uh, you know, finished behind the uh, stronger uh, players. In 1970, he again qualified for the for the World Championship cycle. By this time, he was 42 years old, and he felt that he was past his peak as a competitive uh, chess player. So what he did is he gave up his place uh, to Bobby Fischer, who was 15 years younger. So Bobby Fischer's in his 20s. And the reason is, is uh, Benko felt that he didn't have a real chance. At the time, uh, amongst the Western players, Fischer was considered... The, the best uh, hope of beating uh, Boris Baskey. Uh, so um, Banco gave up his uh, his spot, which is, you know, a noble move because, you know, players work, you know, their whole lives, you know, to get to the, get to the opportunity. And uh, so he gave up his spot. Um, Banco was given $2,000 by the U.S. Chess Federation for doing it. Uh, although Banco himself said the money was actually... Uh, a fee to assist the players in that year's interzonal tournament anyway um uh you know uh, which was the first step on the road uh to the chess championship so um you know very uh noble move uh by banco um banco was born in france uh in 1928 while his mother and father were on vacation. So he's a Hungarian player, but he was just happened to be born in France. He learned how to play chess when he was eight years old, uh, but he didn't begin playing in tournaments until he was 17, mostly because of the um, problems brought on by World War II. All right? His father and his older brother were sent to Russia to work as laborers, and his mother died uh, just as the war was ending. But once he started playing... Um, Banco 
uh, improved quickly and he won the Hungarian championship when he was only 20 years old. All right. Now, in 1952, Mr. Benko uh, <laughs> qualified for the first stage of the World Chess Championship uh, cycle. But before he could compete, he tried to defect to the West while playing in a tournament near Berlin. He was caught and sent back to Hungary and he was imprisoned for 16 months. All right. And he was freed only after Stalin's death when many political prisoners were given clemency. So already just extremely interesting life. Um, 1957, uh, he was playing in another tournament, this time in Reykjavik, uh, which is in Iceland, and he defected, all right, after just walking into the American embassy. He was allowed to emigrate to the United States, where he settled and eventually became a citizen, so this is how he, uh, winds up in America. Um, over his career, he played and defeated many of the world's best players, Fisher, Petrosian, Tao, Smyslov, um, he wound up being inducted to the U.S. Chess Hall of Fame. Um, and what he's known for now is basically two things. One is the Banco Gambit. If you uh, don't know about the Banco Gambit, you probably haven't played play, uh, chess too long. But yes, he is the uh, not the creator of it, but he is the one that popularized it, analyzed it uh, deeply and... Uh, you know, and this is why it has its namesake. The uh, Soviet name is the Volga Gambit. But as we know, the Soviets, you know, they took credit for everything. But uh, it was known as the the uh, Volga Gambit. Uh, but um, after Benko got a hold of it and started analyzing it and playing it in the late 60s and 70s, uh, it uh, took on this name of the uh, Benko Gambit. All right. And uh, later on in his career, he... Uh, he became known for studying the end game, and he had, uh, for decades, wrote in a column in the uh, Chess Life magazine, in the U.S. Chess magazine, uh, in the end game lab, where he uh, went over uh, end games. And because of his end game expertise, he was uh, a tutor for a lot of players um, from Hungary, and among his students were the Polgar sisters, okay, uh, and Peter Laco who at one time was the youngest grandmaster in history. So um, thank you for bearing with me, um, you know, in that little brief autobiography about how Banco, I thought it was necessary. Indeed, a great player, you know, but a little bit obscure for many people. So we're going to get right into this study again. Is white to move here. And in order for us to really get, you know, the principles uh, out of the position, we first have to analyze the position, okay? It's not enough just to solve it because you you won't remember anything that's useful. We want to analyze the position. So what's going on here? First, we see that white is up material, okay? So white is moving um, from bottom to top, right? The pawns are going up, so that, that way there's no confusion. So we see that white has three pawns, black has two. So white is up material, the second thing that stands out immediately is the positions of the kings, right? White's king is far away from his pawns and all the way up top, okay, on the sixth rank. So although black is down material, he's closer to the pawns. And we can already see that black simply wants to go to b3 with his uh, king, pick up this b2 pawn, and promote this a pawn immediately all right and there's really no way uh for um uh, white to stop this plan okay that's the first thing you must realize so yes you're up material but you're going to be down um material soon right if you don't uh act uh quickly so due to the um bad placement in this position of the white king um it looks like black uh, is has a simple plan of just going to b2 b3 with this king b2 capturing the pawn and then just queening uh, the a pawn all right so once we realize this then we have to try to um, assess the position are we better here as white are we losing and or, or are we just equal 
Okay, well one thing we can say we're definitely not better here. As already said, there's no way to stop Black's plan. All right, from uh, queening a pawn, we cannot we cannot stop it. So once you realize that, you have to figure out well, can I draw here? Okay, so I'm definitely not I'm definitely not better, but can is there a way to draw or what's the best way um, that I can put up the most resistance in this uh, position here? All right, so first, the the first idea that comes to mind, well, is as black moves his king uh, closer to the B pawn, well, the C pawn will become free. Okay, so I can, for example, um, let's say play a move like, um, let's say king F5, for example. Right, with the idea of going after this H pawn. So let's say King F F five, King C four, and of course you would be doing this in your head over the board, but King G four, King B three, King takes King takes B two and now C four, right? A three, C five, A two, C six, A one queen, and we see there's a problem already because black queens first, c7, and then queen c1, and the game is over. So we see that these ideas of white just going to have a race with black don't really work. Uh, don't really work in his favor. Um, so if that's not the case, then we have to figure out another uh, defensive uh, scheme here and so we're going to get into uh, the study right now so as you may have, might have seen when I made this first move white plays king d7 okay so it looks it looks kind of weird like why play uh, king d7 well we already realized that we can't stop um, black from queening first so what we want to do is create a position whereby um, black uh, white is protected from checks after queening. Okay, and that this will give him time to be able to uh, promote uh, his own pawn. Okay, so king c4 and now king c7. King B3, and now King B8, King takes B2, C4, and the race begins. Now notice in this position, black has no checks, right? How is he going to, he can't, how is he going to get to the the white queen, I mean the uh, white king. So c7, again, there's no meaningful text. So queen g1, c8 queen, and from here, black is able, uh, excuse me, white is able to draw the game. So queen takes g2, for instance, and just simply queen h8 check, king b1 followed by Queen takes h4. Another example or another possibility is uh, queen b6 here. And just simply uh, queen b7. I'm sorry, not, <laughs> not queen b7. That's losing uh, uh, king a8. You have to keep the, king, the, uh, the queens on the board here. So queen a8 and same, same uh, draw. Uh, will result here. So we can see that white, uh, black is able to draw by putting his king in the position uh, to avoid the uh, the checks of his opponent. So in conclusion, uh, we must realize in this in this type of scenario that we have to get to the the major crux of the problem here 
and this is really about tempo right and time so first we realize that hey um white cannot stop blacks plan period so in our um minds we must realize that hey this is a time uh problem so black is going to queen first but we have to figure out a way to get a uh, extra tempi so that we can also promote our pawn and the only way to get this extra time is by creating the position where white's queen is uh free uh from checks uh white's king is free from checks and that's the that's the basic um uh, crux of this position here is recognizing that that you are worse here and that you must try to draw but then realizing that it's really about gaining extra time so that you might uh, queen also so while black is uh, going after the b pawn he removes the blockade off the c pawn and so while he's doing that what you must do is set up this position whereby you are able to uh, draw also all right and it's very important because if you um, don't understand that you need uh, to avoid the checks what can happen here so for instance you play like King uh, b7 what can happen here is that after King takes b2 c4 a3 etc c6 black has this very strong move h3 but it has the same idea and what it does is clear this diagonal here so after h3 let's just say for instance g takes queen and now you can see it here check and it all boils down to the same idea is uh Avoiding the king exposure. Another variation here is the c7. And then h2. And this actually. Allows black to win also. By a long convoluted process that we won't uh, go into at this point. This is why King B8 is accurate because it eliminates all possibilities of checks along the A file and also along this, this diagonal right here. <clears throat> and the king on B2 actually blocks the queen from being able to being able to utilize this diagonal also so I just wanted to share this end game with you and um, you know and show you that even in like positions that look uh, you know really you know really bad that sometimes that there are drawing possibilities there and uh, you really have to uh, sometimes work hard uh, to find these um you know hidden uh possibilities uh in in the position but again it's not about this position per se because again you might never see this position in your whole entire you know chess career you know that this exact position but you might run into similar uh scenarios you know here where you already know okay i can't stop this guy from queening like some people might have just resigned resigned here and they realize that the king is just going to march down the board uh, to the b2 pawn and they don't see uh, any, any way to uh, deal with it. Or they might be lazy and, for instance, just make, um, you know, make any, any type of move. Maybe go after this pawn or something like that, right? Or they may make the first move, right, but without any uh, plan in mind. You know, and then instead of start going to the dark square, you know, say they might just go, you know, just go up here. King D8. And again, you see, you already know that's losing right away. All right. 
and c7. King takes b2. And king b8, and of course you can see that this pawn will fall. Just want to make an incorrect move here. King, so king d8. And now if we start trying to push here. A3. And you can see the problem here. What's the problem here? Right. The king is standing right on the C file. So you can see how like little moves like, like that. Like without, if, you, if you're just playing without really thinking or pay, paying attention. You lose the game. And this is why this particular variation loses because the king is right here. You need the king to be off to the off to the side in order to promote the pawn. So anyway, like I said, um, I hope you enjoyed this video. Please uh, check the links below. There'll be some DVDs uh, related to the end games and things like that. I really encourage you to study the simple king and pawn end games and not just try to look at them as far as just solving them, but look look at the the whys of it. try to try to really understand it because then you can apply the logic to other positions so really try to get deep into it and um and um understand why you know a certain position works because that's what these studies do is they kind of teach you how to think right because again you the practicality value is pretty low like you're not gonna see this position probably like you know you might play a thousand games you know and never see this exact position so it's stupid just to solve the puzzle and move on what you want to do is extract extract the principles that you and this is what grandmasters do this is why they can play blitz chess so fast and speed chess and bullet chess because they're running on well of course memory and stuff from the opening but when it comes to these endings everything is just principles and shortcuts principles and shortcuts because the end game theory doesn't change so if you learn the end game and become strong in the end game you'll always be strong in the end game so you can learn openings and then uh a year from now you know if you haven't kept up to date on the opening now now you're like you fell off right now you now you're weak in opening theory because you now you need to brush up but if you get strong in end games you'll always be strong in the end game because the theory's not going to change so um, like I said, let that uh, encourage you. Check the links below. Please donate to my channel. This videos, you know, are to your liking. And please hit the thumbs up and subscribe and all of that. Because it just helps move the videos up in the uh, algorithm um, that Google uses, right? To decide who is going to be seen, who's not going to be seen, and all of that stuff like that. So this is uh, really good content. This is stuff that I wish... That I knew when I was first starting out. I wish that when I first started playing chess, that I started learning from the end game, and end game middle, you know, end game backwards, you know, learning simple king and pawn positions first, and learning how to think because that's what it's really about. Is you have to learn how to think in chess, all right? So it's just a something that it takes time and it takes a lot of. Um, you know positions and just learning little by little but like anything else you have to learn the simplest portions first and go from simple to complex not complex from to simple when you start out playing with all 32 pieces you're starting from the most complicated position because now you have to think of what's going on with the knights the bishops the rooks queens the kings all this stuff and the pawns Right, you're starting out already on, on, you know, the highest level of difficulty and learning from there and then slowly learning where you're, you, you should learn from the most simple things. King, one king, one pawn, another king. Master those positions first. Then add two pawns and so on and so forth. So again, um. I uh, hope you uh, liked that video. Um, like I said, check the links below, etc. And I'll see you guys soon. I want to hear your comments and uh, suggestions down below. And, uh, you know, we'll see you soon on the next video.